Good evening, it's 7.30pm on July the 11th, feast day of St. Benedict, one of my very fa favourite um, saints. I love all the saints, but I do have a, a great devotion and love of him. And I'm wearing a Benedictine crucifix all the time, usually all the time, a wooden one sometimes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrust me here, ever this night be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide, Amen. And for the faithful departed, all the saints and martyrs, all our loved ones, friends, and those we don't know, and those who've no one to pray for them, eternal rest grant to them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. The microphone's not straight in front of me. I'm doing the saints from butlers and the date of the saints today is for uh, 10th of April. And the names of the saints are Saint Badimus Abbot, A.D. 376. The Martyrs Under the Danes, A.D. 870. Saint Macarius or Macaire of Ghent, A.D. 1012. Saint Fulbert, Bishop of Chartres, A.D. 1029. Uh, Saint Paternus of A.B. Abingoff, A.D. 1058. Blessed Anthony Nerot, Martyr, A.D. 1460. Blessed Mark Fantusi, A.D. 1479. Finally, St. Michael de Sanctis, A.D. 1625. So we'll begin in a moment. I'll just have sort myself out. Because I have a cold still, it's driving me mad. It doesn't seem to want to go completely. Just have to live with it. So the first saint is, I hope you can hear me because there's no room for the microphone in front of me. Saint Badimus Abbot, A.D. 376. One of the victims of the persecution under King Sapa II of Persia was a holy abbot whose name is Latinized as Badimus. He was a citizen of Bethlehem, who had founded near the city a monastery over which he ruled with great repute for sanctity. He was apprehended with seven of his monks, condemned to be beaten daily, loaded with chains and imprisoned in a dungeon. About the same time, a Christian at the Persian court, Nursan, was also apprehended because he refused to worship the sun. At first he showed constancy, but at the sight of his torture, his resolution failed and he promised to conform. To test his sincerity, Saper suggested that he should kill Badimus, promising that he should be restored to favour and to his former possessions if he would comply. Nursan consented. A sword was placed in his hand and the abbot was brought into his cell. 
as Nursen advanced to plunge the weapon into his victim's body, terror seized upon him and he stood for a time motionless, unable to raise his arm. Badimus remained calm and fixing his eyes upon his would-be assailant, he said, Nursan, to what depths of wickedness you must have sunk when you can not only deny God, but can also kill his servants. Willingly do I give myself to be a martyr for Christ, but I could have wished that it might have been by some other hand than yours. Nursen, however, hardened his heart and made a thrust at the saint. But his arm was so unsteady that he struck several times before he inflicted a mortal wound. Oh, I've never heard such a horrible story as that, have you? How ghastly. How ghastly. He must have had a weak faith. And he must have gone to hell. The Martyrs Under the Danes, AD 870. In one of their numerous descents upon Anglo-Saxon England, the Danes made their way up the Thames as far as the Abbey of Chertsey, where they massacred Bioka the abbot, a priest called Hethor, and a number of monks. These are said to have been as many as 90 victims they are reckoned as martyrs because the Danes showed special ferocity towards those whom they regarded as the representatives of Christianity. At about the same period, similar massacres occurred in different parts of England. At Madershamstead, the site of the modern Peterborough, that's my nearest uh, place for um, Spuck um, supporters, uh, life for the unborn and others. And uh, it's not far from me, really. You can get two buses to Peterborough. Abbot Hedder was slain with all his community to the number of 84. There were also raids made into the Fen country, which is around Ely, where there's a, a cathedral, and at Bardney, Ely, and probably at Croyland. All the religious were exterminated. In the Abbey Church of Thorny in Cambridgeshire were venerated the relics of three anchorets of whom tradition declared that they had suffered martyrdom in the same year, 870, at the hands of the Danes. They, the very lack of details in our chronicles is probably due to the desolation almost everywhere created among those who alone could make any pretense to scholarship. There's a lot of history of martyrdom roundabouts. The next saint is Saint Macarius or Macaire of Ghent, G-H-E-N-T, A.D. 1012. Saint Macarius or Macaire is popular throughout Flanders 
where he is regarded as patron against epidemic diseases of all kinds. Very little is actually known about him, but as frequently happens in the case of uncanonized saints, honoured locally, fiction steps in where history is lacking. He is supposed to have been Archbishop of Antioch, and it is possible that the Macarius, who about the year 970, was presiding over the church in Antioch in Pisidia, may have nominated and consecrated this younger namesake as his successor. He was certainly never Archbishop of Antioch in Syria. To escape the honours which threatened his humility, says the legend, he distributed all his property to the poor and went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. There he was captured, tortured and imprisoned by the Saracens. But making his escape, he came to Europe, which he traversed, performing many wonderful miracles on the way. Thus he passed through Mainz, Cologne, Malines, Cambrai, Tournai, until he reached Gehent. All we can be sure about is that in this latter city at Macarius was hospitably received as a poor pilgrim by the monks of St. Bavon who allowed him to remain in their hospice and that he fell a victim to the plague which was ravaging the country, as the pestilence ceased directly after his death, as he had prophesied would be the case, he was held to have offered his life to God in expiation for the sins of the people. The next saint is Saint Fulbert, Bishop of Chartres, And he is from A.D. 1029. We learn from St. Fulbert of Chartres himself that he was of humble extraction. But we know little of his early years beyond the fact that he was born in Italy and spent his boyhood there. He was later on a student in Rems and must have been one of its most distinguished scholars for when the celebrated Gerbert, who taught him mathematics and philosophy, was raised to the papacy under the title of Sylvester II, he summoned Fulbert to his side. When another pope succeeded, Fulbert returned to France, where Bishop Odo of Chartres bestowed upon him a canonry and appointed him chancellor. Moreover, the cathedral schools of Chartres were placed under his care, and he soon made them the greatest educational centre in France attracting pupils from Germany, Italy and England. Regarded as a paragon of learning and described as a reincarnation of Socrates and Plato. Oh. I've lost my place. He stood as a bulwark against the rationalising tendencies of his day. Although one at least of his pupils, the notorious Berengarius afterwards lapsed into heresy. Upon the death of Bishop Roger, 
Fulbert was chosen to succeed him in the See of Chartres. In his humility, the prelate elect wrote to Abbot St. Odillo of Cluny that he trembled at the prospect of leading others in the way of holiness. When he stumbled so repeatedly himself, but he was obliged to accept the office. Fulbert's influence was now immense, for besides retaining direction of the school, he became the recognised counsellor of the spiritual and temporal leaders of France. Yet he never ceased to deplore his unfitness for the position he held and was wont to describe himself as the very little bishop of a very big church. External affairs were never allowed to interfere with the duty he owed to his diocese. He preached regularly from his cathedral pulpit and exerted himself to spread instruction in the territories under his jurisdiction. When soon after his elevation, the Cathedral of Chartres was burnt down, he at once set about rebuilding it with great magnificence, though this is not the cathedral which is now one of the glories of Christendom. People of all classes came to his assistance, including Canute, King of England, who contributed a large sum. St. Fulbert had great devotion to Our Lady, in whose honour he composed several hymns. And when the beautiful new cathedral was opened, he caused the recently introduced feast of her birthday to be celebrated there with great solemnity as well as to be observed throughout the diocese. Like most of the more eminent churchmen of his century, he was an outspoken opponent of simony and of bestowing ecclesiastical endowments upon laymen. After an episcopate of nearly 22 years, he died on April the 10th, 1029. The writings of St. Fulbert include a number of letters, a brief penitential, nine sermons, a collection of passages, from the Bible dealing with the Trinity, the Incarnation and the Eucharist, and also some hymns and proses. Very interesting saint. Very special day. I have a little grandson, adopted grandson. Abraham, bless him, born on that day. He's about seven now. So I'm going to read now. St. Paternus of Abingdon, A.D. 1058. Many ecclesiastical writers make mention of the recluse, St. Paternus, whose death seems to have left a deep impression on his contemporaries, notably on St. Peter Damien and Blessed Mariano Scotus. By birth, he was probably an Irishman, but he found his way to Westphalia where he was one of the first monks to enter the monastery of Abinghoff, founded by St. Menwork. Feeling called to complete retirement, he obtained leave to be enclosed as a solitary in a cell adjoining the abbey. He prophesied the destruction by fire of the city within 30 days 
unless, unless the inhabitants would turn from their sins, but was laughed at as a visionary and an alarmist. On Friday before Palm Sunday, 1058, fires broke out simultaneously in seven parts of the town, which was completely destroyed. The monastery itself was burnt down. The monks were saved, except Paternus, who refused to break his life vow of enclosure. Burnt to death by the fire, or possibly suffocated by the smoke, Marianus Scotus says that he visited the ruins a fortnight after the fire and prayed on the very mat whereon the recluse had suffered and died. How come it wasn't burnt all up then? How strange. Blessed Anthony Neroit. What a strange name, Nerot. Nerot, Nerot, N-E-Y-R-O-T, Martyr. Blessed Anthony Nerot, Martyr, A.D. 1460. Anthony Nerot was born in Rivoli in Piedmont and entered the Dominican Priory of San Marco in Florence. Then under the direction of St. Antonianus, after being professed, he was sent to one of the houses of the order in Sicily. Between Naples and Sicily, his ship was boarded by pirates who carried him to Tunis, where he was sold as a slave. He succeeded in obtaining his freedom, but only to fall into a worse captivity. For the study of the Koran led him to abjure his faith and to become a Muslim, but it's written Mohammedan here. For several months, he had practiced the religion of, of the false prophet, his eyes were suddenly opened in consequence, it is said, of a vision he had of St. Antonianus. Smitten with contrition, he at once sent away his wife. He had a wife! <laughs> he did penance and resumed the daily recitation of the office. Well, what a mixed up man he was. Then he went before the ruler of Tunis, in his friar's habit and in the presence of a great crowd, openly renounced his heresy and proclaimed the religion of Jesus Christ as the one true faith. Oh, oh, oh dear. Arguments, promises and threats were employed without being able to shake him. Eventually he was condemned to death and perished by stoning and by sword cuts as he knelt in prayer with his hands upraised. What a nasty death. His body was given over to the flames, but portions of his relics, which remained unconsumed, were sold to Genoese. What a thing! Genoese merchants who took them back to Italy. The cultus of Blessed Anthony was approved in 1760. 1767. What a gory story. Oh dear, oh dear. But I'm glad he, he did become a martyr rather than stay with what he changed. <laughs> dear, dear, dear. So now it's Blessed Mark Fantucci, AD 1479. Amongst the Franciscan leaders of the 15th century, a special place must be assigned to Blessed Mark Fantucci of Bologna, to whom he was mainly due the preservation of the observance as a separate body, when it seemed on the point of being compulsorily merged into the conventual branch. 
after having received an excellent education to fit him for the good position and large fortune to which he was left the sole heir, he had given up all his worldly advantages at the age of 26 to receive the habit of St. Francis of Assisi. Three years after his profession, he was chosen guardian of Monte Colombo, the spot where St. Francis had received the rule of his order. So successful was he in converting sinners that he was given permission to preach outside his province by St. John Cap Capistran, then Vicar General of the Observance in Italy. Having served twice as Minister Provincial, Blessed Mark was elected Vicar General in succession to Capistran and showed himself zealous in enforcing strict observance of the rule. Okay, the various reforms he brought about all tended to revive the spirit of the founder. After taking the taking of Constantinople, so many Franciscans had been enslaved by the Turks that Mark wrote to all his provincials urging them to appeal for arms to ransom the captives. But in answer to a request for instructions how to act in the danger zone, he sent word to Franciscan missionaries in places threatened by victorious Islam, Islam bidding them remain boldly at their posts and to face what might betide. He was able to execute a long-cherished plan to form a convent of poor clares in Bologna. St. Catherine of Bologna came with some of her nuns from Ferrara to establish it and found in Blessed Mark one who could give her all the assistance she needed. He visited as commissary, commissary all the friaries in Candia, Rhodes and Palestine. And on his return to Italy, he was elected vicar general for the second time. Never sparing himself, he undertook long and tiring expeditions to Bosnia, Dalmatia, Austria and Poland, often travelling long distances on foot. Pope Paul II wished to make him a cardinal, but he fled to Sicily to avoid being forced to accept an honour from which he shrank. The next Pope, Sixtus IV, formed a project which was even less acceptable, for he had set his heart upon uniting all Franciscans into one body without requiring any reform from the conventuals. At a meeting convened to settle the matter, Blessed Mark, used all his eloquence to defeat the proposal, but apparently in vain. At last, in tears, throwing down the book of the rule at the Pope's feet, <laughs> he exclaimed, O oh, my seraphic father, defend your own rule, since I, miserable man that I am, cannot defend it and thereupon left the hall. The jester accomplished what argument had failed to do. The assembly broke up without arriving at a decision and the scheme fell through. In 1479, 
while delivering a Lenten mission in Piacenza, Blessed Mark was taken ill and died at the convent of the observance outside the city. His cultus was confirmed in 1868. And I'm going to read St. Michael de Sanctus as the last and then do St. Leo the Great for the 11th of April. And then I want to go to do 26th of April is my mother's birthday. 29th of April is my son's birthday. And 30th of April is my friend Barbara from Jamaica who lives in England since maybe 10 years old and she's retired. Uh, I would like to do the same, but, but I'm going to do my best because I have to give this book back tomorrow. So I'm going to read now St. Michael de Sanctis, A.D. 1625, and then St. Leo the Great, A.D. 461, because he's a Pope and Doctor of the Church. So I'm going to continue unless I stop and then do the others. Maybe I should do that because this will be a few more minutes. I might just do that. Stop after Saint Michael, Saint Michael de Sanctis, and then open a new video for the other ones I would like to do. That might make sense. They won't be too long then for you to listen to. Saint Michael de Sanctis, A.D. sixteen twenty-five. This Michael was born at Vish in Catalonia in fifteen eighty-nine or 1591, they're not sure. And when six years old, announced that he had decided to be a monk when he grew up. His mother, having told him about St. Francis of Assisi, he set himself to imitate that saint in ways unsuitable for his years. Doubtless his prudent parents restrained his ardour, but he retained his enthusiasm for St. Francis. When his father and mother died, leaving him the guard to the guardianship of an uncle, he was put in the service of a merchant. Young Michael had no fads about being above mere trade and did his work well. But whenever he was not at it, he was doing works of devotion assisting at the divine office when he could and saying the little office of Our Lady every day. His master was thoroughly edified, held up Michael as a pattern to his family and raised no objection to the boy joining the Trinitarian friars at Barcelona. He took his vows at the monastery of St. Lambert at Saragossa in 1607. About this time, Blessed John Baptist of the Conception had rallied many of the Trinitarians of Spain to his congregation of reformed Trinitarians whose greater austerity was indicated by the wearing of sandals instead of shoes. One of these discalced brothers Coming to St. Lambert's to be ordained, Michael was moved to offer himself for this harder life. His superiors gave the necessary permission he was received into the novitiate at Madrid and some time later he renewed his vows with them at Alcala. He studied at Seville and Salamanca was ordained a priest and his virtues and ability caused him to be twice named superior of the convent at Valladolid. His religious could not only loved him as a father but revered him as a saint and he set them a special example of devotion to the blessed sacrament. Several times he was wrapped in ecstasy during mass and he was God's instrument in the working of a number of miracles during life and after his death. 
which took place on April the 10th, 1625, when he was only 36 years old. St. Michael de Sanctis was canonised in 1862 and he is described in the Roman Martyrology today as remarkable for innocence of life, wonderful penance and love for God. Yes, I will, I will leave that there, end the video and begin again. God bless you all. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your comments. Sending you peace and prayers. And may you always be happy and joyful in the Lord. God bless the rest of your evening, your day, night or morning. Thank you. God bless.